Well, let me tell you a little bit about Mary Ann Prater, who we are honoring as the 2014 Alice Louise Reynolds Lecturer. Prior to becoming Dean, Mary Ann was a professor of special education at BYU for 12 years, six of them as chair of the Department of Counseling Psychology and Special Education. Previously, she was a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Dean Prater earned her PhD at Utah State and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Kentucky. She has worked in the field of special education for over 30 years, having served as a special educator and parent educator, as well as a professor and administrator. Her research interests include instructional strategies for students with mild disabilities, preparation of future special educators, special education for multicultural students, and portrayal of disabilities in juvenile literature. She is the author or co-author of eight books and over 100 research articles in refereed journals. Dean Prater enjoys traveling, reading, and counted cross-stitching. And for those of you who read the BYU alumni magazine, you'll remember that uh, within the last year, some of Marianne's counted cross-stitch uh, work was featured as part of a series of articles about um, what faculty members do uh, in their spare time. So I would, I would recommend that uh, to you, although I would imagine that your spare time has really diminished substantially uh, in recent months. So we are delighted to have Marianne here, and she will um, give her lecture, and then um, she anticipates that that will run till about 10 till 3, so if there are people that need to leave for class, they are welcome to do so. There will be a brief question and answer period following uh, the lecture. So please join me in welcoming Mary Ann. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I'm honored. Um, let me get this going here. There we go. Um, Alice Louise Reynolds was quite a woman, and um, I'm very honored to um, have this opportunity to be the lecturer for this, for this year. If you've paid attention, then you know that my presentation today is on the portrayal of disabilities in children's literature. Um, I, I want to start with my personal journey. I think it's kind of interesting to find out why would I choose this as a research interest. Um, as a child, I wasn't much of a reader. I was kind of a semi-reader. I was a little bit hyperactive, and sitting down to read a book just wasn't part of my agenda. Um, but I discovered children's literature in college. I've always kind of been a late bloomer. And um, I took a children's literature class as part of my special education teacher preparation program and fell in love with it. Um, in fact, the instructor announced that they were looking for a part-time librarian in the children's room in the Salt Lake Library. And so I rushed and put my application in, and I got that job. And so I loved um, not only studying it academically at the university, but also being a semi-librarian uh, without any training. But at least I, I knew a little bit about the field to direct people. Um, and then I used literature as I became a special education teacher, so that I thought it was important for children with disabilities, with mild disabilities, were the ones that I taught, that they had um, a love for literature as well and tried to incorporate it as I could into my instruction. As a professor, um, I really used this adage that find something you really enjoy and then find a way to get paid for doing it. And I really loved children's literature and realized that there really was a void in the field in terms of um, looking at how individuals with disabilities are portrayed in that kind of a literature. And so for 
15 plus years, I've been analyzing characters with disabilities in children's literature. So why would we want to do this? Why would I want to do this? Um, well, one is that we know that, that literature can facilitate change in attitudes and knowledge. Um, and that if we have accurate portrayals of disabilities and children are reading those uh, books, then they will have a better understanding of disabilities. Um, that accurate information can be promoted and we can also use those books to teach children about disabilities. Um, children's literature has also been used as a form of bibliotherapy. And in this sense, so I'm talking about children who have disabilities, reading about others who have disabilities and recognizing they're not alone and that they can empathize with others who have similar situations. So my first big study was in 1999. Um, and I was at a national conference, but it happened to be in, um, on Maui. But I was living in Hawaii at the time, it was employed by the University of Hawaii. Um, and I did a pretty massive analysis of books and presented it at this conference. And who should be there but Tina Dykes, who uh, was from BYU, and Sharon Kramer, who was from Buffalo. And um, all three of us were very intrigued with this topic, and we had a conversation after the presentation. Thought, how can we, what can we do to promote uh, good quality literature that has characters with disabilities for children. And in doing that, after that conversation, we worked very hard and it resulted in the creation of a new award called the Dolly Gray Award. Tina Dykes, who is still on faculty here, um, continues to chair the selection committee for that award. And let me tell you a little bit about it. It was started in 2000, and this award is given every even year. Um, we decided to do it every other year because the volume of books that were being considered for this award were, was not great. And if we did it every year, we would have a small number. So it's given every other year. And it recognizes authors and illustrators who actually have or considered high literary and illustrative quality within their book. And that it portrays individuals with disabilities in a multi-dimensional way and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that um, and it's sponsored by the Division of Autism and Developmental Disabilities of the Council for Exceptional Children and this is a picture of Dolly Gray she is a real woman who has passed on she had cerebral palsy and but she loved to read and this book award was named in her honor so I want you to just think for just a second here, we won't take much time, about any books in your life that you've read that have included a character with a disability. Yes. Okay, we're gonna talk about that, the curious incident of the dog in the night time. Charles. More juvenile. We're talking about juvenile literature here. Not, not like <laughs> Classic. Book oh, book. chapter book. Well, chapter books qualify. So we are talking about both picture books and chapter books. One more, Melissa. Jane Eyre, where at the end, Mr. Edwards has the blind. Okay, Mr. Edwards is blinded in the end. And one more. The Secret Garden. Absolutely. You've listed a couple that one that we'll talk about in here and, and another one that I'm going to mention. So here's some from classic, I put that in quote, um, some of them are more classic than others, of characters with disabilities in the literature. Quasimodo in The Hutchback of Notre Dame, uh, Tiny Tim, anybody think of Tiny Tim in The Christmas Carol? Captain Hook and Peter Pan. <laughs> he had a disability, right? Um, Mary Ingalls in The Little House on the Prairie, Laura Ingalls' sister um, is, becomes blind throughout the series. Colin in The Secret Garden. Colin in The Secret Garden um, has sort of a psychosomatic disability. Um, it, he learns that it really isn't a disability towards the end and that he doesn't need a wheelchair and that he can walk. 
Clara in Heidi is in a, in a wheelchair in that story. Um, and then evil witches in Grimm's fairy tales, um, often short-sighted or blind, deformed bodies, um, and um, sometimes we don't think about that, but those, those are individuals with disabilities in our fairy tales. You know, if we look at historically the way people have used disabilities in literature, and some of those examples that I just listed are some of um, these uses, some of the authors have really used disabilities to portray character, the character's inner traits. Um, if you're um, very small, very large, have deformed faces, um, have sensory in problems, impairments, then sometimes that um, you are, those characteristics are part of who you are and you are either evil or stupid or an outcast. And so they use those uh, physical, mostly, deformities to portray the, an inner characteristic. Um, oftentimes a character with a disability has been used as a catalyst to change someone else's character, uh, to become more appreciative of who I am and what I have by seeing this person with a disability, where the person with a disability may or may not have interactions with the other characters in the story. Um, another common is, um, well, the physical or sensory disabilities are the most prevalent. Hearing impairments, deafness, blind, heart, you know, poor eyesight, individuals in wheelchairs, uh, needing crutches, those sorts of things are most prevalent historically. And also, historically, stories have not been told from the person with a disability's point of view. They've been told from someone else's point of view. And sometimes, it says often, maybe I should say sometimes rather than often, disabilities are cured. Um, I think I have this as an example later, but what happens to the prince in, in uh, Rapunzel? He becomes blind, and then how does he gain his sight again? Do you remember? It's the tears of his loved one, okay, cures him. So oftentimes disabilities are cured in our traditional literature. Well, I want to talk about some of the criteria that we use to actually select this Dolly Gray Award because we're trying to promote appropriate portrayals. So in terms of personal characteristics, we want it to be realistic. You might think, well, why wouldn't a book have you know, realistic characteristics portrayed. Um, I can just think of an example. I won't cite, well, okay, I'll tell you who the author is. Maria Shriver, you know, has written a book that has a character with a, a child with a disability in it who has very great cognitive language, but with the disability that the character is supposed to be portraying, it's not realistic. Um, and so we want we want it to portray the kinds of characteristics that we see in, in children or adults with disabilities. We want it to emphasize similarities. So rather than looking always at the differences between people with disabilities and those without, we want the, the, dis, the similarities to be emphasized. And non-discriminatory language is really important and to avoid stereotypes. This can get a little bit tricky because, um, let me give you an example. Um, Within recent years, the federal government has changed language in, le in uh, legislation. Instead of talking about mental retardation, we talk about intellectual disabilities. That's the new uh, term for individuals with cognitive impairments, intellectual disabilities. Well, you're not going to find a lot of books right now that use that language, but hopefully as time passes, it will be become more prominent in in um, the way those individuals are described. Um, it's not uncommon to have teasing and victimization in a story where a child is called a retard, for example. And if it's in there to try to show victimization, then that's okay, but we don't, we, we would like the author to also indicate that that is not appropriate language to use. Um, we use 
a person comes first with a disability after, so you will hear me say not disabled individuals, you'll hear me say individuals with disabilities. We want their social interactions to be appropriate. Um, we want them to be in some kind of reciprocal relationship um, where it's not one person always giving to the other. It's not the mother always caring for the child, but the child gives back in some ways. Even if it's as small as a, a smile or a, you know, a nod of the head, a recognition of the help that the mother is providing. We want there to be some kind of reciprocity. Uh, obviously, we, we want to pr promote empathy but not pity for the character as the story in, uh, evolves. And then um, we look at the various relationship. Uh, sometimes there'll be individuals in storylines that are afraid of people with disabilities and they'll avoid them. Or there, there will be some victimization and I'm going to share you an example of that in a second. So we also look at exemplary practices. You're sort of getting special education 101 in here if you haven't noticed. Uh, we want them to receive services that are appropriate for their age skill and interests. We want them to have full citizenship opportunities in integrated activities and settings. We don't want them always segregated from their peers in how they do recreation or how their workplace or in their schooling. And we, but the attitude and the practice need to be congruent with the era. If it's written a hundred years about, a, the story is taking place a hundred years ago, then segregation is more appropriate for that era than it is today. We're also concerned about the sibling relationship. This comes up a lot in books that um, have children with disabilities in them. Um, we want the siblings to experience a wide range of emotion because that is typical of siblings with um, and their, their uh, sister or, or um, brother who has a disability. But we want that relationship um, to be also reciprocal, just like the peer rec reciprocity, given the age and the type of disability. Point of view, I already mentioned earlier that most, historically most books are not told from the point of view of a person with a disability. We also look at literary quality. We're very interested, of course, in, in well-written books. Um, and main focus is an issue. Sometimes people write books uh, about a child with a disability and the focus is to teach about the disability. You know, Johnny, the child with autism might be the title of a book. And obviously they want to teach about autism. Um, and that's fine and it has its purpose. But for this award, we're primarily interested in stories that are not there to particularly teach something specific. We want really good stories who happen to have a character with a disability in it. And of course, if they're picture books, then we look at the quality of the illustrations, including any kind of um, equipment or technology that the person might require. Paul. Well, I think the obvious answer to that, Paul, and I've got some data to show you in a second, um, is because um, often people don't think of those with disabilities as um, telling the story. Um, and particularly if you have a character with a cognitive disability, that people don't think, well, they could tell the story. They, they see them as an outsider to the story. Um, there's a really good book called The Bus People. Did I get it right, Tina? The Bus People. And it has stories. Every chapter is about a different child who go on the special bus. And it is told from their point of view, even if they have a severe cognitive disability. And it's quite intriguing, but that's very unusual to find. Good question. Thank you. So this is just a sample of some of the articles. Um, that first, that first um, study was done on what was then called mental retardation. We've changed in 15 years. Um, that's the one that I presented in Hawaii that connected me up with Tina and Sharon. Um, Tina and I have 
and with Sharon have done other studies here. Um, and I'm not going to go through each of those. I was very interested at one point in looking at learning disabilities and how those are portrayed, because most of the previous have been mental retardation or intellectual disabilities and um, autism, but looked at learning disabilities. Um, Dr. Dykes and I have looked at how disabilities are portrayed in Caldecott books. Um, Dr. Dykes about, well, in 2008 and I we thought, you know, we've collectively been at this for, at that time, about 25 years. Um, let's do a top 25. <laughs> and this was just based on our perspective of the best books at that point in time. And that was fun to do. Um, and then we've also looked at Newberry books and how they portray disabilities. So I'm going to show you some data from sort of a synthesis of these articles. And um, some of the things that we've looked at is the depiction realistic, partially realistic or unrealistic. Development, is it dynamic or static? And by that we're meaning, does the character with disability evolve in a positive way or are they really static and, and, and don't change? There may be a catalyst for somebody else to change. Is the portrayal positive, partially positive or negative? And um, the point of view, we're interested in uh, persons with a disability or without a disability. So here are some data. In 1999, that first article, the, the, I don't know if you can read it, but this is percentage right here. And so in this particular um, study of intellectual disabilities, less than 50% were, and that color is dynamic. So they were basically pretty static characters. And since there were 68 books, that's quite a bit for an analysis like this. Um, that was very interesting. Here we've looked at autism. This is the 2001 and the 2005. There were 12 books in this one. There were 34 in this one. And it's a little bit better. <laughs> I mean, these are not statistically significant, obviously. But it just kind of shows what we're hoping is a trend. That the light blue is realistic. The dark blue is dynamic. and the green is, was it a positive portrayal? And then we did it again in 2009 uh, with 41 books, and this green one comes down quite a bit in terms of a positive portrayal. We also looked at point of view. Whoops. Um, that first article, 18% out of 68 books had a point of view of a person with, with intellectual disabilities. Autism and, and intellectual disabilities um, has come up. This, this year it was really good. It, so you see the numbers down here. 2001, it was 25%. But then it really dropped for some reason. Am I going too fast? OK. Um, and, but learning disabilities is almost 60% of the characters are the, those books that were analyzed were written from the perspective of a person with a learning disability. And only 13% of the Newberry books. Now, this might be not a surprise. It wasn't to me, because children with learning disabilities are viewed as capable of you know, being the storyteller, where a person with autism or a person with intellectual disabilities, less so. So what are some of the um, themes that we've discovered in these analysis? Um, We've looked at relationship among the characters with and without disabilities. Often, there's a victim that's involved, and it's often the person with a disability, although sometimes it's not. Um, a perpetrator or a protector, um, dependent and caregiver, someone is caring for the person with a disability, pupil instructor, reciprocal fr friendships, fear of association, and feelings of guilt. Um, another some of the changes we've seen in characters without disabilities, they've improved their feelings toward the person with a disability through the course of this, this story. Their character flaws um, improve. The character with disabilities sometimes do evolve. They might change um, due to their relationship or an event that occurs, or the change might be sought for uh, by the character with a disability. They want to change. They want a new experience. They want new friends, whatever it may be. 
So when books include individuals with disabilities, what should they portray? We, and I say we because Tina Dykes has done a lot of this research with me, um, believe they should portray realistic characterizations, which is a little bit redundant from what I've already said. But this is the book that was mentioned at the back, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. It's gotten a great press. It's won all kinds of awards. Um, this is written from the perspective of an adolescent with Asperger's. Um, I thought something was wrong with this book when I first read it, and I read it before it was famous, because it starts with chapter two. And then it goes to chapter three, and then it goes to chapter five, and then it goes to chapter seven. See a trend? Then it goes to chapter 11. Prime numbers, exactly. And that's what this quote is. I know all the countries in the world and their capital cities and every prime number up to 7,057. In this particular story, let me just read the back of this. Christopher uh, John Francis Boone knows all the countries of the world and their capitals and every prime number up to 7,067. He relates well to animals, but has no understanding of human emotions. He cannot stand to be touched and he detests the color yellow. Um, and what he's doing is it starts out and he sees that there's a dog that has been impaled by a rake fork and um, he's out to figure out who killed this dog in his investigations. And it's a fascinating story. Um, let me just read a piece of it. I think you always get a better flavor if you hear the language. I decided that I was going to find out who killed Wellington, that's the dog, even though father had told me to stay out of other people's business. This is because I do not always do what I am told. And this is because when people tell you what to do, it is usually confusing and does not make sense. For example, people often say, be quiet, but they don't tell you how long to be quiet for. Or you see a sign which says, keep off the grass, but it should say, keep off the grass around the sign, or keep off all the grass in this park, because there is a lot of grass you're allowed to walk on. Also, people break rules all the time. For example, father often drives over 50 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone, and sometimes he drives when he has been drinking, and often he doesn't wear a seatbelt when he's driving. And the Bible, in the Bible, it says, thou shalt not kill, but there were the Crusades and two world wars and the Gulf War, and there were Christians killing people in all of them. And it goes on. And so that's told from the perspective of somebody who is, sees the world from needing rules and explicit rules. Um, and why we break rules doesn't make sense. Another important characteristic is, is that it emphasizes friendships between the character with and without disabilities. This is another book. This one won a Newbery Honor. And um, it's called Crazy Lady. My old versions of the book are different than the picture you see up there. Those are the most current um, renditions. But it's the story is told of Vernon and his friends. And they're always making fun of Maxine, who is an alcoholic, and her son, Ronald, who has intellectual disabilities. And um, Vernon isn't doing very well in school, and he needs to be tutored. And Miss Annie, who was uh, a retired school teacher, um, takes on the challenge to tutor Vernon. And, but in payment for that, she asks that Vernon help Maxine and her son, Ronald. And in this experience, Vernon has a 180 degree turn and begins to become friends with Vernon and um, advocates for him. He turns from being a tormentor to a protector. Um, I like this quote, I'd, I t I'd talk and Ronald would listen, but by now I knew his face so well it was almost like he could talk. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you the ends of these stories. You'll have to read the books. <laughs> Another characteristic is that it depicts characters engaging in socially and emotionally reciprocal relationships. It's 
So here's an example of that, um, keeping up with Rue. Gracie and Rue um, are best friends. It didn't matter that Rue was almost as old as Mama and Gracie was only five. And Rue helps raise Gracie. Um, and one of their activities that they enjoy is playing school. And Rue would be the teacher and Gracie would learn from Rue, Rue her alphabet and one plus one equals two and some very basic skills. Pretty soon, Gracie gets old enough to go to school. She goes to school and she begins to learn more than what Rue knows. So she comes back home and she begins to be the teacher and teaching Rue things like how to spell November. Um, but it doesn't become, doesn't take too long before Rue does not want um, to play with excuse me, Gracie does not want to play with Rue anymore. And she'll go over to her friend's house after school instead of coming home. And one day, one of her friends, one of Gracie's friends comes home with um, Gracie after school and they start playing out in the yard and they see Rue. You can see that picture in her in the background. It's kind of hard, but she's got these funny ribbons in her hair and she's running crazy. And, and Sarah, the friend says, who is that? And Grace says, oh, I don't know her. She won't admit that she's her aunt. And then they go into the house and they start doing some things and playing and, and Gracie begins to realize, Sarah will say, well, where did you get that? Well, how did you learn to do that? And she kept saying, my aunt taught me. My, my aunt gave that to me. She begins to realize that she does love her aunt and she shouldn't be ashamed of her. And so she says to her friend, I want to introduce you to somebody and they go find Rue. Portrays, portrayals um, have an opportunity in integrated settings. This is a fun book, True Confessions. It's a story told of two, of, of twins. Uh, True, her name is Trudy, but she goes by True, and her, her twin, Eddie. Eddie has a developmental disability, and um, Trudy really takes care of him and watches out after him. She has two goals in life. One is to cure Eddie from his developmental disability, and the other is to be a television host on a TV program. When she finds out that they're having a local contest, a video contest, she decides to make a video and enter it into the contest, and she decides that her best subject is Eddie because people don't understand him. He's been victimized. In fact, there was a movie made out, a Disney movie made of this story, and Shia LaBeouf, LaBeouf am I saying his name right, um, plays Eddie in that movie. In the movie, or in the story, he is in a regular classroom, even though he has a disability, and that's the example that I'm using there. Um, describes attitudes and practices congruent with the, that era. I bet you didn't ever think that Johnny Tremaine has a person with a disability in it, and the person is Johnny Tremaine. If you think about it, if you remember the story, this is a very famous book, Johnny Tremaine is a, an apprentice to a silversmith, and in an accident, he burns his hand on hot silver, and he can no longer do the job as an apprentice at a silversmith. So he has to go looking for employment elsewhere. And because it impairs his employment, we consider that a disability. Now here, this quote also puts it in context of the times. He's no more good than a horse with sprung knees. We want books that portray realistic sibling relationship. This is a great picture book. It tells the story of two sisters and their brother go for a walk to the park. And Ian has autism. And his, his uh, stroll to the park, he attends to things that are different than his sisters. The things he hears, sees, smells, and tastes are different than the things. He pays attention to the ceiling fan as it's going around. As the siren of the fire truck passes by, he ignores it. He's listening to something over here. He wants to put his ear to the sidewalk to see what he can hear. It's very, you know, very unique kinds of things that most of us would not think of doing. Um, when they get to the park, he ends up getting lost. 
and his sister has to think what I'm going to get in his mind and think what would he be intrigued with why where would he have gone and she realizes that one of the things he loves are bells and when she hears he the big bell ringing in the park she goes I bet that's him sure enough she finds him and on the way back she begins to pay attention to the ceiling fan and putting her ear against the brick wall and doing some of the things that her brother does uh, to gain a better appreciation for where he's coming from. I like this quote too though, but she says, she offers him pizza and he says, no, he wants the old Power Pop cereal, dry cereal. So he's eating that and she's like, sometimes he just makes me angry. And that's a realistic, you know, reaction of a sibling. Uh, this is a great book. This was a Newberry book. The View from Saturday, and it's um, a story of uh, Mrs. Olinsky is the teacher, and she puts together a team of four students to be the sixth grade academic bowl team, and it tells the story and interweaves their interactions and their relationship. The reason I like this story as this example is you don't find until, I wrote it down, page 23 that Mrs. Olansky has a disability. And you don't find out until page 68 why. And so it doesn't start out with Mrs. Mrs. Lewins, oh, Olinsky is in a wheelchair, and she's our teacher, and she had a car accident. I mean, it's just interwoven in the story as it evolves about her and her situation. I mentioned earlier that we have looked at some of the Caldecott books and how they portray disabilities. Um, I would assume since you're at this lecture you know about the Caldecott, but maybe not. It's the American Library Association Annual Award for the artist of the most distinguished American picture book. There have been over 300 um, medal and honor books since its initiation in 1938. In 2006, we found only 11 of over 300 that had any kind of a character with a disability in it. And most of them related directly to the plot. Now, here's an example, Seven Blind Mice. You might know that story. Um, and you might not think that that's a disability, but it is. <laughs> Being blind is a disability. Um, and some of the portrayals were not very accurate. In my example earlier of Rapunzel, where the prince's um, blindness was cured by tears. We've also looked at Newberry Medal and Honor books. Again, uh, the American Library Association, and this is for the author of the Most Distinguished Contribution to American Literature for Children Award. Melissa Leininger, one of our graduate students, did an analysis of a, a 131 books between those years that are portrayed there. Those would be, again, Newberry Honor and Newberry Award winning books. We found eight medal and 23 honor books that characterize disabilities. Um, and we did an analysis of not just looking stagnantly across all of that year span, but breaking it up by decade. And we found that over time, the portrayals have improved. <clears throat> um, but only 13% overall um, the stories were told from the character with disabilities point of view. Um, and 77% included a character with a disability whose presence and disability impacts the story. So it's not like Mrs. Ol Olinsky who just happens to have a disability in the story and it doesn't really make a difference to the storyline. These, these books tended to, it made a difference in the storyline. Um, this was shocking. 28, 26%, about a quarter of them eliminate the character with disabilities. They either remove them from their home or through death. Even in Crazy Lady, Ronald is removed from his alcoholic mother at the end. It's probably a good thing, you know, for him, for his situation, but it's just sort of a solution to the problem is just take him away from his mother. Others that have been, um, they, they die um, as part of the story. And 9% eliminate the disability through some kind of a miraculous cure. So those, those are really not uh, realistic portrayals of characters with disabilities. Here are some of the books that Tina and I put on our top 25 list. Some of these you might recognize. I've only listed the ones who um, have some, received some kind of award. 
Newberry Caldecott or Dolly Gray Award. And in conclusion, I would really like to read and have you read this with me, Mark Haddon's Dolly Gray Award. The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime won the award for the Dolly Gray that I've talked about at the very beginning. And this was his, his uh, acceptance speech. I never set out to write a novel about a teenage boy with a disability. I simply set out to write a good novel. Indeed, I simply set out to write the first page of a novel which would grip readers and make them want to know more. Hence, the dog, dead dog impaled on a garden fork. I then realized that the scene, with apologies to any dog lovers in the audience, was funnier and more intriguing if it was described in a totally deadpan voice. I started using this voice and fell in love with it. Only then did I begin to wonder who the voice belonged to. You'll notice that the spelling in here, he's British. Whoops, going the wrong way. Christopher appears in the novel not because I had an ax to grind or because I a point to make. He appears in the novel because he simply came into my head at the right time, perfectly equipped to solve a problem just as all characters do. And if Curious Incident works, it works, I think, for precisely this reason, that it is not a novel specifically about a disability. It is a novel about family breakdown and the magic of books, a novel about prime numbers and astronomy and chaos about maps and dogs and trains. As a very wise friend of mine said, it isn't a novel about someone with Asperger's, is it? It's a novel about a young mathematician with a few behavioral issues. Indeed, many readers reach the final page of the book and realize that it is the other main characters in the novel who are wrestling with major disabilities and not Christopher. So whilst I'm grateful, very grateful for this prize, I would also like to look forward to a time in the not too distant future when such prizes seemed outdated and unnecessary, when children with learning difficulties of all kinds are as much a part of our society as children with red hair or children who play the clarinet or readers do not even notice when a book contains a character with learning difficulties because such books are as common as rain. Thank you. I was told to break right now, if, but if you have any questions, you're welcome to stay for questions. Yes? Yeah, I didn't really bring any negative ones, did I? Um, I guess it kind of depends on, I'd have to rack my brain for some negative examples. Tina, have you think of any? Um, the purpose of a negative? Well, um, Which one's that? Um, that neutral. Okay. Bol he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, right. He slobbers, he drools. I can't stand him. Throughout the whole book. And so there's no, there's no real justification for having that person with a disability in that story other than as a catalyst for the, for the brother to hate him. Um, I could think if I wasn't standing right here <laughs> of some negative examples. Um, Welcome Home Jelly Bean is a book that's, that's an old book. It tells the story of a child coming back from having been in an in institution. Um, could be used more as a, a, a book that supports what isn't appropriate today, what we don't do today, than is something that we would promote, a child being sent to an institution without real cause for that. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but there are a handful of books that are just, one of the books that actually won a Newbery Honor book, I can't remember the name of it, Day, 
the universe book, um, where the, the uncle comes to love, live with a, his family and he has Down syndrome. And he, corner of the universe. Corner of the universe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I knew somebody. <laughs> no, thank you, Rachel. Um, in the end, he, he dies, and it kind of solves some issues in the story. He just dies. And that won a, a, a Newbery honor. Not that it wasn't an otherwise interesting story, but, you know, from our perspective, that's kind of negative. Other questions? Yes. Well, here's one right here. It's not with a severe disability or with autism, but it's written from a person with a learning disability. And that's Patricia Pol Polacho, am I saying her name right? Um, this is a pretty well-known book, Thank You, Mr. Falker. And she tells the story of growing up unable to read and being taunted and bullied to the point where she runs and hides during recess because the, the kids just make fun of her, especially one who's sort of the, the leader. Um, and it's not till she gets to fifth grade does a teacher really realize that she can't read, which is a sad commentary. But in fifth grade, um, he, the, the new teacher, notices that she is bullying, being bullied and stops the bullying and takes her under his wing to teach her how to read, even um, tutoring her after school. And it's not till the very end that we learn that this is autobiographical, that she is telling her story. And she actually illustrated this book as well. And she is, um, throughout the story, she's known for her drawing. Everybody knows she's a great artist, but she can't read. So there are some that have been written. Can you think of others, those of you that? Great. Other questions? Yeah. That's a really great question, Paul. And the answer is no. That's easy. <laughs> we haven't looked at other countries. I, I can say that Melissa Heath and I were in China in November and did a session with a group there on bibliotherapy and the use of, for, for teaching about disabilities or teaching, Melissa did a thing on teaching, uh, using books to, to deal with grief. And my sense is that um, in, they were really, the teachers there in China were really eating it up, but they don't really have the same uh, wealth of literature for children that we have here. In fact, they said in their libraries that they have, they have math and science books, but they don't have children's picture books. It just, when you, uh, yeah, it's a different before, culture. Yeah, and I think, you know, we have focused the, um, the Dolly Gray Award, which has taken a lot of effort on English, speak, you know, English written books, and so we haven't looked beyond that at all. Maybe one more question, if there is one. If I could just Or just put in the search 
Fox Dolly Gray, Dolly Gray Award, and all of the books that have that have been won or can even considered for the award are, are, are part of our collection, and it's it's an open collection that you can check out. So it, it, it's probably the most comprehensive collection of, of disability books in, in in the world, I would think, because it, it spans a wide good ones and bad ones. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Well, I appreciate your attendance.